What is up everybody, Dan in the Fireman here. Today we're gonna to be going over two motorcycle braking mistakes. And at the end of the day, it's really just practicing and finessing your progressive braking, making sure that you're getting it dialed in so you know what you can do on the motorcycle, understanding total stopping distance, all these different things. But today we're gonna to go over two scenarios where progressive braking would have helped tremendously and figure out why these people crashed. So right away, I'm gonna go ahead and list a possible factor of this crash as low visibility because of nighttime. So we're gonna move forward just a little bit more right here and we have an intersection. Remember what I tell you guys all the time during the live streams and then in these videos, look for patterns. Patterns, 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 patterns. Because remember, at the end of the day, we're not gonna be able to figure out every minute detail of everything while we're riding. It's just too much information, too much bandwidth going on in our head. So we have to look for special patterns and then maybe even do some default situations like an intersection, right? You heard me talk about that. Intersections are default orange stage. Orange stage is when you're a little bit paranoid, you're ready to act just in case something happens, but you saw a hazardous item, hazardous thing, or hazardous situation. Intersections are hazardous situations because it is extremely deadly for motorcyclists, okay? You know, the NHTSA and, and NTSB, all these different people have done research studies that almost about half of all motorcycle crashes that happen, happen at intersections. So I focus a lot on this. So quick editor's note, I'm taking a look at some of the 2016, 2017 data. And right here, it does show 35% are at intersections. So it's not uh, the half that I just mentioned. So I wanna make sure you guys have the best information. But here's one of the things that there, you're starting to get a lot of really weird things. So 42% of these crashes and other vehicles were turning left while the motorcycles were going straight. So my assumption here, is 35% uh, is the fatality rate, but injury and crash rate are a little bit different. So guys, take that in mind. Speeding and alcohol are still the number one killers, but on intersections and cars uh, doing a path of travel violation are very important. But I just wanted to share that links are in the description. So if we look at this pattern of the side of a vehicle, that is what I want you guys to pay attention. If there's a vehicle that there's a side of it and they're traveling, especially if the nose is going towards where you are supposed to be going, good chance that they're gonna be in your path of travel. So another possible thing, I mean, it's, it's, it's not even say possible, it is a factor that a path of travel violation of this driver. If you notice that it's green for us, more than likely it's red for them. So, you know, path of travel violation, not following the road rules, all these different things, we can go down this rabbit hole of why, 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 which I want you guys to do and pick out your own things. The main thing here is what we do as motorcyclists. So we're gonna go ahead and see this happen and we're just gonna run right into him. Now, why did that happen? Well, I can't go into his brain, I can't figure out what's happening with him, but what I can do is go off of what information I do have. This whole time, he did not reach for that front brake. So that front brake is not being applied, not being applied, not being applied. You can see his hands are not reaching over to it. We're still not applying it, still not applying it, still not applying it, and now we crashed into the vehicle, okay? So total stopping distance is not gonna be that great for this situation, especially about right here is when you see the vehicle start to enter the intersection. We're not gonna do very much in terms of that. We talked about swerving in a previous video in a previous parking lot exercise. In this situation, a swerve might be the best option. Swerve right where the gap is increasing versus the gap closing to the left. All these different things, but what are we here for? We're talking about motorcycle braking his right hand did not touch that front brake. Now, I don't know if he went into brown stage, I don't know if he did, went into red stage, but tried to do progressive brake pressure with his right foot, which would be the rear brake. Unsure of what happened here. I don't even know if he saw or she saw, whoever saw, the rider saw the uh, truck right here. I don't know that. What I do know is that there was no braking pressure. And with my motorcycle coaching uh, education, uh, I know that the front brake offers quite a bit of braking power. And if it's not utilized, we can't use or do anything in this situation. And it's not good. We don't wanna be doing that. If you wanna watch the full video and see the aftermath, please do so. Um, I'm gonna start showing just the moment of impact or even right before the impact. That's what we're gonna be doing here. Anyways, uh, moving a little bit further and I can't tell if his rear tire is sliding. I can't tell if anything outside of the fact that there's gonna be definite two factors in this crash. There's going to be this truck red light running and path of travel 
violation on that. And then also low visibility because of nighttime. It's just as simple as that. Uh, a possible factor is uh, no activation of any of the braking. Uh, there is no activation of emergency swerving. Uh, it's, we basically just ran into this vehicle. Now, we don't know what's going on in the head. Maybe it's after a bar. Maybe he's drunk. Maybe, you know, a big fight with the missus and took his bike out and just was hauling ass. I mean, nobody knows in this situation. But with those possible factors, make sure you're not driving drunk. Make sure you're not getting in arguments and getting on the bike and riding angry. Ride to relax, but take it easy. You don't want your adrenaline up because you're going to start making some really bad movements on the primary controls and making some bad judgment calls. Make sure you're paying attention too, because this could easily be prevented if we just saw this vehicle ahead of time. Once again, low visibility, and this person wasn't supposed to do that in the first place. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one so that we can determine what happened there. So in this situation, it's going to be a single vehicle. It's going to be the red motorcycle right here and the rider riding it. And th what happened was the person fell down. Now, how did that fall down? You know, why, why, why? And that's what I want you guys to start doing. You know, my why might be different than your why based off of the information you have versus my information. But that's the beauty of going through a root cause analysis is that everybody's going to have slightly different. But if we combine everything together as a community and we can start to figure out what is really going on. So he fell down. Uh, why? Now, if we move forward uh, up here. Let's go ahead and take a look. So this is where everything really started to happen. If you notice, the handlebars are starting to slide down like that. That's because the tire has no traction. That, it, it's, it's, it's obvious. There's no traction. There's no friction of the tire with the asphalt. It just completely slid. Now, what possible factors? Why? Why would that happen? Well, uh, PSI? Tire PSI? Well, that could be a possibility. We don't have that evidence. What about uh, tread on the tire? Uh, is it good? Is there enough tread for the tire? Is it, is it going to water displace? Well, we don't know. So that's a, that's a possibility. There's no evidence supporting that. And then there's also, you know, did he slam that front brake? Now, it doesn't look like he did. His right hand doesn't really move that lever at all that much. I mean, he reaches for it about uh, right there. So he's reaching for it. He's going to go ahead and start squeezing, maybe. I'm unsure how much input he's actually putting into it. And then we go over the paint. So maybe right going over the paint with a little bit of brake pressure, with possibility of low tire, PSI, uh, tread damage, all those different things, with the paint... Uh, it could have lost traction there. Okay, cool. So now we understand that. But then how do we not do that? That's, that's the thing. You know, how do we prevent that without having to utilize a ton of brake pressure or use braking in an emergency situation or even a situation where we have very low stopping distance? Uh, situational awareness is going to kick in right here. This is where we should be slowing down way over here, to be quite honest. Whoa. We should be slowing down about over here because we see brake lights, we see that there's a lot of people stopping, we see that, and we need to start applying progressive brake pressure right now, okay? So you can start slowing down, you can start getting that weight transfer to that front tire, and then by the time you really do need to stop, you're gonna have a lot of weight on that front tire. So anyways, uh, he's gonna go ahead and dump the bike right here, and this, we don't have enough information, to be quite honest. We really don't have enough information of why it fell, other than the fact that it did lose traction, okay? That front tire did lose traction. Now, if we do fall down, what do we do? What do we do? Uh, we're just gonna fall. So make sure you have full gear and make sure it's proper gear because then you're gonna have impact protection, abrasion resistance, all these different things. Have full gear, guys. It's very, very important. But how do we prevent this thing? I, I truly believe that if we had a longer total stopping distance, if we saw the need to stop way ahead of time, we could start applying more brake pressure uh, sooner by waiting for that weight to transfer on that front tire and more and more and more. And by the time we actually had to stop, we're already at 80% brake pressure. We just need to give it a little bit more. So guys, this is why I tell everybody to take it nice and easy, take it nice and slow. Be aware of the rain. Be aware of painted surfaces. Be aware of your tires. Do your T-clocks, everything, because it's very important because all these little factors, all these possible factors could have led into that crash but we don't know. So what I like to do is make sure I have them all covered. I'm going to make sure I have a T-clock. I'm going to make sure I practice my braking. I'm going to make sure the tread depth is good. I'm going to make sure I'm going to, I'm going to do as much as I possibly can so that in an emergency situation, I am hundred percent confident in the motorcycle and my training. 
just in case an emergency situation comes up. With that said, though, I want you guys to stay safe, be safe, practice this weekend, and join the Discord. There's going to be a little pop-up up here, and I want you to click that button. Over 3,500 members, just saying.